if you're going to talk about demons, you should start with the devil. Do, do you like the feeling of power you have as a newspaper proprietor, of being able to sort of formulate policies for a large number of newspapers in every state of Australia? Well, there's only one honest answer to that, of course, and that's yes. Uh, of course one enjoys the feeling of power, although I think this question of the power of newspaper proprietors can be greatly overdone. Um, we have certain, but we can, we have more responsibility than power, I think. The newspaper can uh, create great controversies, stir up uh, uh, arguments within the community, discussion, uh, can throw light on injustices, uh, just as it can do the opposite. It can hide things uh, and be a great power for evil. How can you know that I'm self-censoring? How can you I know that you're self-censoring? I'm sure you believe everything you're saying. But what I'm saying is if you believe something different, you wouldn't be sitting where you're sitting. One of the cardinal rules of being a columnist is loudly proclaiming, nobody tells me what to write at every possible opportunity. That's not, in fact, a lie. It's just that nobody needs to tell most columnists what they can and cannot say. It's implied, and the day a columnist steps out of line is the day they're out of a job. Over time, the Overton window, the range of political positions considered acceptable in the mainstream in Britain, has shrunk to the size of a cat flap, but columnists still manage to contort themselves into pleasing shapes for their proprietors, though they'd all assure you they serve their readers. I feel inadequately prepared for, for um, going wild on, on YouTube, which is a thing that I don't understand. I watch TVs, proper TVs, where you stand up and change the... If you want to be a British newspaper columnist, you should really be related to someone who's already in the media or politics. Sinecured Times writer and Times Radio presenter Giles Corrin is the son of Alan Corrin, who bestrode the BBC, Punch, the Daily Mail and the Times like a chuckling comedy colossus. Daily Mail sketch writer Henry Deeds is the son of Jeremy Deeds, former chief executive of the Daily Telegraph, whose own father was Lord Deeds, the politician and former editor of... The Daily Telegraph. Henry's cousin, Sophia Money Coots, also has columns in the Sunday Telegraph and the Evening Standard. The BBC is on its fourth set of on-screen Dimblebees, while Corrin's colleagues at Times Radio, Flora Gill and Hugo Rifkin, are both the progeny of famous politicians. Gill has the added bonus of being the daughter of the late Times mainstay A.A. A. Gill. Indian Knight, another Times columnist of very long standing, just happens to have a stepfather, Andrew Knight, who's a former economist editor and is chairman of the Times' holding company but you'd be a bitter begrudger to suggest that any of them owe their opportunities to nepotism. Don't tell me about the press. I know exactly who reads the papers. The Daily Mirror is read by people who think they run the country. The Guardian is read by people who think they ought to run the country. <laughs> the Times is read by the people who actually do run the country. The Daily Mail is read by the wives of the people who run the country. The Financial Times is read by people who own the country. <laughs> The Morning Star is read by people who think the country ought to be run by another country. <laughs> and the Daily Telegraph is read by people who think it is. <laughs> I'm Prime Minister. What about the people who read The Sun? The Sun readers don't care who runs the country as long as she's got big tits. One of the favoured verb conjugations of the British columnist is I am sensible, you are a troll, they are extremists. Just as Jim Hacker and Yes Prime Minister could so confidently define who read each newspaper, each title has its own slightly different type of columnist. The Sun has populist ranters whose pop culture references and view of society stopped developing in the 1970s, even if they weren't even born then. The Telegraph employs zealots who think everything went to shit after decimalisation, but would be most happy if we lived in some kind of Pleasantville recreation of an imagined 1920s. The Guardian opts for centrists who explain mournfully why things are bad, but can never change, while the Times oscillates between technocrats and government mouthpieces who find ever more ingenious ways of blaming minorities for the country's ills, while snidely entreating the rest of us to be kinder. The Daily Mail specialises in women who hate other women, and men who hate everyone, both kinds of columnists united by a tendency to claim patriotic devotion to Britain, while actually hating absolutely everything about it, beyond flags, singing, and informing on your neighbours. Uh, I used to have all the normal human drives for food, water, sex, but now I only have one drive for column ideas. That's all really? I care about. So I used to think, you know, if I got hit by a bus and I lived, I could get a column out of that. Uh, I, I had a fantasy of winning the lottery, but it was not for the money. It was because, oh, I could get a column out of that. 
Uh, I once had, so, and it doesn't come that naturally to me. Some people it comes naturally. I once had lunch with George Will, and I, I said, what's your next column about? And he pulled out a little index card from his wallet, and it had his next 13 column ideas. Wow. And I wanted to take my knife and just jam it in <laughs> Philip Roth, who almost had an ego big enough to be a newspaper columnist, said, Nothing bad happens to a writer. Everything is material. That's the mindset you need if you're going to pound out thousands of words a year on topics that you may only just have heard about, but about which you must profess to be an instant expert. Never, never, never admit you're wrong. That's the kiss of death for a columnist. Instead, mutter about changing your mind when the facts change, or simply ignore what you wrote last week if it turns out to have been abject horseshit. The key is that you remain confident that whatever you're saying at any given moment is 100% right. That you were disastrously wrong about a policy, a person, or, you know, a string of calamitous illegal wars doesn't matter if you simply ignore it. Your editors won't say a word as long as you seem certain that you're correct. And the readers, well, you're not doing all this for them, are you? And how the hell would they know what's right? can't be a British newspaper columnist without going on about George Orwell. Don't worry though, you only have to read three things. Animal Farm, for quoting when you're having a go at the left, 1984, for when you're having a go at the left, and Why I Write, for when you're slagging off other writers who want to feel superior. Advanced level columnists can imply they've read Homage to Catalonia, The Road to Wigan Pier, or Down and Out in Paris and London, but even they actually haven't read them. Why bother when a half assed understanding of Big Brother, Napoleon and Newspeak is all you need? And if someone tells you that you've completely misunderstood Orwell, just point your finger and sneer that they're Orwellian. It never fails. <laughs>